Welcome, everyone. All right. Just going to get a few more seconds because I'm still letting people in. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. All right. Hi, Jen. Hey, Tony. How are you? I am well. You still have pink hair? A little bit. <laughs> oh, I love it. It's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's pretty fun. But I might, I might I should, have to do a nice color. I don't know. I should. I don't know. Everybody's doing it nowadays. I mean, yeah, why not? All right. <laughs> All right. I'm actually making pink boots, uh, the pink boots beer today, too. So. What, be, what kind? What kind of style? That's uh, New England. We also have a, uh, uh, it's a New England with uh, uh, Lulo. You know what Lulo is? It's like not on here. It's a, uh, it's like a, it's like a tomato, but citrusy. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it'll be fun. That's awesome. Pink hair. Don't care. Pink boots. Awesome. <laughs> you know what I say? Fuck it. <laughs> Everyone, everyone's on it today. All right. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> Blame it on him. All right, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to HOPS 101. My name is Jennifer Myers. I'll be the moderator to this session. We are in day 10 of the New York State Craft Brewers Conference presented by DWS. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to touch on a couple things. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this session, it's going to be a three-part presentation. Please go ahead and put your uh, questions in chat and we'll call, you, call on you when it's appropriate, or you can use the hand emoji. If you wouldn't mind uh, keeping yourselves on mute uh, throughout the session, just, just uh, to help with any background noise. I also want to thank our Friday uh, session and presenting sponsors. Our Friday presenting sponsor is Cool Insuring Agency. And our Friday session sponsors are Omega Yeast, Ontario Insurance and Company, and Viatran Printing. So big thank you to our sponsors for making this happen. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. First, we have Dietrich Gearing from Indian Lander Farms, Charlie Talowski from Hopsteiner, and Spencer Tilke Meyer from Yakima Chief. I hope I hope I got those right, guys. <laughs> Welcome and, and thank you guys very much for uh, coming together to talk about Hops 101. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is going to be a three-part presentation. So first, we're going to start with Dietrich, who is going to go over uh, Hops 101, basic hops and growing. And then we're going to go with Spencer's presentation that's going to talk about advanced hop techniques. And then Charlie is going to get into advanced hop techniques with oils. So uh, I think I made you guys all co-hosts, so you, go, you guys are good. Go ahead and start the presentation. All right. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a PowerPoint that uh, uh, my wife Lori and I put together a number of years ago uh, for um, the book that we published a few years ago, the Hop Growers Handbook, which is still available uh, from Chelsea Green and Amazon. It's a, kind of a cookbook if you want to get started in uh, small scale hop production. Um, this uh, is going to mostly focus on um, if you are wanting to grow on, you know, for like an acre or two acres or something like that, but it can, if you're a home brewer and you're watching this, don't be afraid. I mean, growing hops is not um, as scary as I may make it seem. Uh, you can always grow a few hops in your yard and your garden and so on and be successful. It just, it's like any farming venture. Once you scale up, um, it becomes a little more daunting. So let's uh, start the PowerPoint. All right. This one. All right. This is the first I'm doing a. Perfect. They're seeing exactly what you're doing. Excellent. All right. So we started growing hops here at Indian Ladder Farms. Um, it's going on 10 years now. Uh, and we have learned a tremendous amount in that time period. And um, every year we, we learn <laughs> uh, more. Uh, we're, we're getting better at it, but by no stretch of the imagination are we uh, you know, uh, entirely experts as we've found out. Um, so it's gonna run through some important things here. Um, 
I think most of you are already uh, sufficiently obsessed with beer, so we're good there. Uh, the other thing to know is we get we get calls all the time. It's like, oh, I want to grow hops, and uh, you know, I, if I hear my wife on the phone going, "Have you ever grown a plant before?" Then you know, <laughs> we have to start from there. Uh, hops also require um, a fair amount of land, um, and they require a certain um, kind of land. It has to be well drained. Uh, you want it to be level because you're putting in a trellis system that'll be um, 18 feet tall. So you get in an angle at 18 feet, it uh, becomes rather treacherous. Uh, hopefully you have some access to some free labor when you start out. Uh, you're gonna need some money to put this thing in the ground considering that one acre of hops, uh, the initial cost is, is somewhere between twelve to $15,000 by the time you were done with the initial buy of the plants. Uh, the irrigation and the most expensive part, which is the trellising. And you want to start with really good trellising. Um, you don't want to have a fear of heights such as I do, um, which I discovered. And check, we're all obsessed with beer. So let's just uh, start from our story. We, uh, we started with basically 100 plants to see what would happen. Uh, we had always grown some hops as home brewers here, um, but very different uh, game once you um, start growing on a larger scale. We uh, are on a 340 acre apple farm. So that is a extraordinary helpful thing to be if you are already on uh, something like an apple farm or if you already grow grapes or something like that, there's the ability to share a lot of equipment. Uh, so the picture you're looking at now is the hop that we used in our home brewing for for years before we ever, sorry about that, somebody is calling me and it's now coming through my computer. Um, so yeah, this hop you're looking at now is almost 40 years old, so they can grow, you know, for a very long time. It still grows in the corner of my garden and um, we still harvest off of it. When we were getting going here, uh, there was you know, tremendous interest in, uh, you know, the resurgence of hops in New York State. So there were a couple of uh, newspaper articles written about us and so on. And so the gentleman you're looking at there, his name is Dan Driscoll. Uh, unfortunately, he's since passed away, but he was a home brewer and hop enthusiast. He um, had and a plant collector and he had gotten some hops that had been growing in the Heldeberg area, which the picture at the bottom you're looking at, that ridge is called the Heldebergs. Um, the hops that you're looking at there are um, a heritage hop that was grown on a farm commercially in the Heldebergs until the 1950s and sold to uh, Schaefer Brewing Company in Albany. Um, Dan brought me eight of those plants um, since then, we've uh, grown that out, had genetic testing done on it. It, it is, it's a, a unique uh, variety of hop, has a nice little bit of a pineapple-y uh, aroma to it. And uh, we are working on um, making that more commercially available. Um, we also recommend that if you're gonna grow hops and you've never done this before, being a high value uh, crop and so on, which you know, high value means high inputs, uh, is to start small. We started with uh, 100 plants. We grew some on the edge of the barn here, which uh, we no longer do that because when, once they got to full maturity, they um, started to pull the side of the barn off. Uh, this, is a, this was our, our 100 plant uh, yard. Again, this one is no longer in existence. Um, from lessons that we learned, um, it was uh, not planted um, in the right orientation. So you generally want to go north south so you have uh, good aeration um, and good um, draining. And um, my phone is going to ring here again. Uh, so, and also I was, I was saying, you know, you really want to have a very good robust trellis system. 
Um, that yard you were just looking at was kind of something we just threw up and um, and it uh, it came down uh, during a windstorm uh, probably two weeks before harvest. Uh, so we were not ready to harvest. So, you know, there's my family trying to uh, make something happen with uh, our first crop. Again, not really ready. There's my attorney sitting there. Uh, we're try trying to dry hops in a makeshift way in our living room. So, uh, even with those problems, we decided to put in one acre with another thousand plants. So this time we're really, you know, doing it right. We're putting the poles in proper spacing, proper anchorage, proper equipment. Um, and you can see here, we've rented some equipment um, using a man lift to tie strings, not the greatest way to do it. Um, it's very time consuming. And also the operator on that is terrified. So you're gonna to wanna to think about what it means to scale up. We, uh, that, that's uh, the picture down the corner is, is Yakima. Um, we went out to visit um, because we really wanted to know, you know, once we were in it, you know, how do you really do it? Um, and they are the people that do it um, on a large scale. Uh, Another thing you want to be, want, you know, you, you've chosen your land, right? You know, we want to talk about well-drained and also um, uh, flat land, um, but weed suppression, um, any kind of um, perennial weed you're going to want to get rid of. Uh, so generally when we put in new yards here, we are starting sometimes as much as two years in advance uh, to get rid of all the weeds, put cover crops on there, um, and then turn the soil. You're going to want to get educated about all these little guys here. Um, they are the problems that uh, exist in, in our yard. Um, uh, potato leaf hoppers for us is a major problem. Uh, and two spotted spider mites are another big problem. We here don't have a lot of trouble with aphids, but I know in Vermont they do. Um, and periodically we get Japanese beetles, which are not so much, um, they make the plants look ugly, but don't really um, do as much damage as, as appears. Um, also the picture on the left-hand side is of downy mildew, which is our largest problem here in New York State. Um, it is a fungal disease um, and it has to be managed. You are never going to get rid of it. It's, it's going to be a control thing. The only way to really do that is you're gonna to have to spray fungicide, whether it is organic or it is gonna be um, non-organic, you, you will have to spray. Um, a lot of people make the mistake and we've seen it here as we pick for other farms um, that uh, people think organic means neglect. And, um, and I say neglect, meaning not doing proper management and spraying. And they're generally in New York State, they're good for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden they get, um, they get downy and it really destroys their crop. Um, one of the mistakes we made uh, was not really planning for processing. Um, uh, you know, we put the hops in, we can grow them. You know, we're farmers, and, you know, we figured all that out, but there was no um, processing in New York State when we started. Um, so we had a hot picking party and drew, tried everything on air dried on fans. Um, hot picking parties are fun for maybe the first or second year and then your friends don't answer the phone. Um, so also the other thing is when do you harvest? That can be very tricky. Um, we do a fair amount of sensory, which you can see uh, there, the tearing the hop in half. Um, a good way to tell is if it uh, easily tears down the strig. Um, and after you're growing for a number of years, you kind of know when your varieties are ready. But the only really true way to tell is to send um, samples, overnight samples to a lab um, and, and find out what your oil contents are so that you can get target dates on picking 
um, and hopefully you haven't missed your target dates uh, when you get your analysis back. Um, so we were still, you know, on the uh, path to how do we, you know, pick this. In the early days, there were in New York State, there were a couple of small hop pickers. We purchased one of them, didn't really pan out for us. Uh, the people who built it didn't really understand what they were um, what they were doing. Um, we still have this thing, and it's more of a boat mooring than it is um, useful to us. So we ended up having another hot picking party, unfortunately, because uh, the equipment didn't work. Um, I'm going to skip this one uh, as we don't do any of that anymore. Also, if you are going into growing, I think a lot of you are brewers and so on. So you're not really, you know, interested in, it's probably going to go to your own place. Um, at the time when we were doing this, we didn't have a brewery. Now we use everything that we grow here on the farm um, and actually are going to plant more because we need more. Uh, we ended up buying a, a wolf harvester in 2015. Um, sight unseen, not knowing how it worked and so on, and it uh, coming in pieces, having to have it welded back together. Um, our kiln came a couple of days before harvest. Again, no instructions. There was no way we were going to get it going. Um, we were able to get uh, what we call our German hop picker, Heidi, um, up and running um, in time for harvest. So we were able to pick all our hops. Um, as you can see, some of these hops are, these are, these are three-year-olds. Um, so they're still, you know, kind of small. Um, so Heidi was able to handle picking them. But we, again, we were having trouble with drying because we really, you know, our oast was in pieces in our barnyard. So moving ahead, um, the following year, we did get our OST built. What you're looking at now is uh, I, I added some slides to show, you know, what most of that show, that presentation was, you know, when we were between one and three years old. And now, you know, we're going on our 10th year and uh, hops are much larger. Uh, the vines themselves are producing a lot more. Uh, we've built a large, this is a wolf kiln from Germany. Um, and as you can see, there's a, there's quite a few hops in there. Um, and, uh, we are no longer trying to bail. Um, we're sending everything out, um, in super sacks, uh, to be, uh, pelletized. And I don't know if this will play or not. Let's see. You can see here, we're also have a different method of picking now or is the full pruner. Our hops are a lot bigger than they used to be. Um, the other thing that you'll ha you'll realize, especially on the East Coast and to the West Coast to an uh, extent, is that your equipment is not um, really available. You're going to have to make some of the stuff yourself. I mean, aside from the hop picker. Like, but again, here you can see that our hops are much bigger than they used to be. This is going to be, you know, you're, you're going to get some hops the first year, second year, third year, but we didn't realize that, you know, really when you get into that fifth year, how big the plants can be, um, each plant can weigh up to like 40 pounds and that little picking machine just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. I mean, even this big picking machine on some cases, we have to slow down. Um, because the vines are so big and it will actually stop working. You can see how many hops are coming out of there now. Again, this is a, you know, no longer using the man lift. This is something we built out of a self unloading wagon because the self unloading wagon is really a, a heavy duty wagon uh, with a couple of uh, tote baskets. And this is actually 
how we drop our strings. Um, now it's a lot faster because we can have two people running down the row um, and doing uh, three lines at a time. But again, that's something you're not going to buy off the shelf. Um, I've seen a lot of homemade ones. And even when you go out to um, Oregon and Willamette Valley and, uh, and Yakima, you'll see a lot of these homemade rigs um, for drop and string. Uh, constantly trying to innovate and figure out how to do things correctly. We're, this, uh, this will be our third year with weed burning. So we're actually pulling a propane tank um, behind, we burn in the spring, we burn the entire yard down. Um, it's uh, to a couple of purposes. We, it's to even out the crop so that any early hop shoots that are coming up, um, we are uh, beating them back so that they all come up at the same time so we can have kind of a consistent harvest period. Um, it's also uh, to control downy mildew um, to kill the spores. But as you can see, we're having to pull a big water tank there too in the springtime so we don't burn the whole yard down. But we're also going through um, numerous times during the season and burning too. Trying to use a little less fungicide, or um, I'm sorry, herbicide. So you can see, you know, what our, our key lessons were here um, that we've learned. Um, The book is still pretty relevant for a small scale startup. I mean, there are, we're really looking at a second edition because of what all the things that we've learned um, along the way so that uh, uh, people can, you know, those last few slides, none of those are in this book um, because we didn't know those things then. And uh, with that, I can take some questions and if, if we have time, or uh, we can move on to uh, Spencer and Charlie. Thank you, Dietrich. Is there any questions for him before? Uh, go ahead, Alex. Or is it Adam? Adam, right? Adam, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'll get it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things I learned just recently is a symbiotic relationship between these uh, aphids and ants. Ants like aphids because the aphids drop some kind of sweet like substance. So what happens, the ants will actually take aphids and bring them to your hop field and hold them hostage and they <laughs> work together. So a great way to get rid of aphids is to actually get rid of your ants. And I've been yeah. using some borax with, with sugar in little jars. And this last year I had all sorts of ladybugs finally because the aphids will take out the ladybugs. Interesting. Interesting. Not many people heard, heard of this. It actually did work very well. No. Oh, yeah. I don't like I said, I don't have a huge aphid problem here. Um, but you know, and I also say that as yet, <laughs> because uh, you know, along the way we've discovered that uh, things crop up. So yeah, I'll keep that in mind. I also put in the chat a really good resource uh, field guide integrated pest management and hops. That's available for free at the link that I provided. Great. Thank you, Adam. All sure. right. Any other questions? All right, Spencer, take it away. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Dietrich, that was really neat. I've, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a start to finish operation described in that way. That's really, that's really a cool, uh, just a cool story to see uh, unfold. Also, your land looks totally gorgeous, and I hope to get to visit someday. <laughs> oh, come and see us. <laughs> um, so my uh, my talk is a bit of a, a gear shift. Uh, it's more intended for brewers uh, rather than uh, being something more specifically related to the grower side. Uh, mostly uh, within the span of 20 minutes, it's pretty difficult to get into any one topic into in great detail. What I hope to do here is hit some some high points of, of quality control for. Uh, what I'm calling high impact hop usage and uh, hopefully start some generate some discussion as a result of that. So my name is Spencer Tilkemeyer. I'm a former brewer of about 10 years. I've been with Yakima Chief for about four years and I'm the East Division lead and Brewing Innovations lead. So, so we are Yakima Chief. Our mission is quite simple uh, and that's to connect family hop farms with the world's finest brewers, which is of course all of you. Uh, we're 100% grower owned. Uh, we are owned by 14 grower families spread throughout Washington and Oregon. 
those folks are uh, on the screen here and uh, we are proud to represent them. Apart from being a uh, hop breeder, or uh, sorry, a hop merchant and a hop processing entity, we are also a, uh, a hop breeding company and our, our breeding arm is called Yakima Chief Ranches. And they are responsible for uh, initial pollen cross all the way to eventual cultivar uh, commercialization. And apart from being a breeding entity, they're also a farm quality management uh, company, meaning that uh, they're responsible for assuring that the Simcoe Citroen Mosaic uh, that you've come to know and love uh, indeed are Simcoe Citroen Mosaic every time that you buy them. So over the years, Yakima Chief Ranches has been responsible for bringing uh, quite a number of, of, uh, of major cultivars to market beginning in 1997 with the Tanum, uh, Simcoe Palisade and Warrior, and then eventually um, after the breeding or the merger with Hot Breeding Company in uh, the early 2000s, uh, some heavy hitters like Citra Mosaic, Equinot Laurel, Sabro Pato, and then one most recently that was released in 2020 called Talus that we will discuss in some detail today. So jumping right into Talus, I'm using Talus as a as just kind of a test case to talk about some of this, these uh, sort of high points of what I would recommend that brewers pay attention to when they're when they're looking at cultivars and how to use different cultivars in their beer. Um, Talus is a good example because I think it provides some some pretty heavy extremes from a um, from an oil component Speaker. standpoint. Uh, this is a uh, a. Uh, slide that's uh, basically uh, from one of the early breeding, uh, one of the early breeding scenarios when we were looking at Talus, back when it was just called HBC 692 and it was what we would call an elite line. So something that's made it through the, you know, eight to 10 year breeding process and has not been cold at that point. And that's kind of rare because most cultivars that, that eventually to make it to market are something like one out of 40,000, right? For every 40,000 pollen crosses, maybe, maybe one will make it to market. So. Something was unique about Talus and uh, it continued to kind of pique our interest because of its performance, both in the field and in beer. What you see on the right is kind of what I'd like to focus on today. And that's, that's a oil component heat map. So as you look at this, what you're seeing is things that are in blue are, are relatively low compared to other major varieties and things that are in red are relatively high. So among these, I would call your attention in particular to um, so geraniol, uh, talus is the highest geraniol hop that we've ever bred, uh, the highest geraniol hop that we grow. Um, and then um, uh, among them, a, a couple others, uh, high linalool, uh, relatively high beta pinene, few other things. So everything, all of these that are, um, that are entering in OL uh, are monoterpene alcohols and tend to make a really high impact in finished beer. And we'll discuss that more in just a moment. So this is one of the ways that we kind of look at new varieties though, as they, as they uh, potentially approach the market. So as I mentioned, Talus is a great case study because it is so high in geraniol. And we, knew, we do know at this point through lots of research that geraniol has a really outsized impact in beer aroma, um, especially when compared with some of the other fractions of, of hop oil. So as, as I mentioned, this was released in October, 2020. Uh, it's aroma, it tends to be bright pink grapefruit, geranium flowers, lychee fruit, rosemary, and uh, even some daiquiri-like flavors. Uh, particularly that, that really straightforward, intense grapefruit is, is kind of its main, uh, a main feature and the, the thing that makes it stand out in beer so much. Uh, I, I did mention before that it is extremely high in geraniol. Uh, you can see it stands at the top of the list, among, uh, even above uh, varieties like Centennial Sabro, Simcoe Idaho 7, which are known for being quite high. Um, the reason why uh, geraniol is so important is that it, it, it does tend to be so durable in the brewing process. So it tends to survive heat. It tends to survive fermentation. It tends to make it into finished beer. And uh, there are actually relatively few components that we can actually say that about. Um, uh, hops contain something like a thousand different compounds, but the vast majority of those are actually not making it into finished beer. So some of our research is intended to really try to kind of work backwards from the ones that do uh, make an impact in finished beer and kind of view different uh, varieties through that lens. So as a result, uh, Talus is an excellent potential dry hop for whirlpool uh, impact, uh, high potential for biotransformation in active fermentation dry hop situations. And that high geraniol content, one of its main sort of advantages is that it helps the aroma profile um, from the raw hops themselves translate into beer, which is one of the more challenging things for brewers is how do we answer that question of like, I smell something on the table that smells amazing, 
how do I make sure that it's going to actually translate into finished beer? So working to connect the dots on that level for brewers. So I'm going to skip ahead to this slide just to, and then go back to that last one. What, what this has resulted in this research, um, you know, there's, I've done a couple of other presentations just specifically on this topic, if you'd ever like to know more in detail, but, but in the, in the, in a, a kind of a long story short sort of way, what we've done here, as I mentioned, is try to uh, find the components of hop oil that we regularly see surviving into finished beer and work backwards so that we're able to look at cultivars through that lens, right? So what allows us to do this is a, a couple pieces of specialized lab equipment, you know, a, a GC QTOP and a GC SCD. Both of those instruments allow us to detect very, very minuscule concentrations of hop oil both in, in beer and in raw hops. And what we consistently see is that these seven compounds at the bottom, there's a few more that we add from time to time, seven to 10, these are consistently uh, showing up in finished beer. And what that leads us to believe is rather than trying to sleuth out what every single one of those thousand you know, compounds in hops is doing in beer, let's just work backwards from these seven and, and try to establish what hops are making those, those contributions that in, in our highest format. So. This graph is really kind of the tip of the iceberg. It was, it was a graph that we just started using internally, but the more we put it in front of brewers, the more we found that it tended to really resonate with them. And the way that we've been viewing it thus far is uh, definitely not intending to oversimplify what hop aroma is, but speaking in extremely broad strokes, hops that are higher up to the left on this side of the graph, so higher in concentration, tend to be able to have their components survive early hopping situations better than the ones that are at the lower end of the graph. So it's not intended to say, for example, that Idaho 7, which is at the top of the graph, is a better hop than Azaka, which is lower on the graph. What it is intending to say, however, though, is that Idaho 7 is likely to make a higher impact in Whirlpool and have its components survive Whirlpool than Azaka is. Whereas Azaka might make a better, might have its fullest expression of its desirable aroma characteristics when used late in the process, because that's gonna give those components the best chance to survive. So once again, this is not intending to make value judgments upon individual uh, you know, varieties. What it is intending to do, hopefully, especially as we refine this research even more, is to describe where can an individual hop be utilized so that it has its best impact in beer, right? How can we make sure that if you're gonna use Idaho 7, you use it in the spot in your beer where it's going to make its best impact? So that's what we're kind of aiming to do with this, with this research. And there's a, like, as, as I mentioned, a whole lot to unpack from that, but in the interest of time today, I'll. I'll just kind of leave it to, at, at that level. But um, we often do get asked about how brewers or for, by brewers about how they can maximize dry hop to its fullest potential, right? How do I dry hop better? How do I dry hop more efficiently? How do I dry hop for the best aroma impact in beer? So in general, um, for modern beer production, uh, I would say the, the rules have changed a little bit because of dosing rates and because of modern kilning techniques and modern production techniques and things like that. So what I would say is I, I generally tend to chalk it up to four main points. There's certainly more that you could talk about, but in general, I would say um, temperature. Uh, I, I would encourage most people to dry hop at fermentation temperature or higher. Um, there is a tendency among brewers to try to do a soft crash at times to help you know, flocculation and things like that. There are reasons why that could be successful in certain situations, but in general, we, I would say that we tend to see that that creates more problems for brewers than it solves. Uh, mostly in the arena of, create, of potential hop creep uh, issues down the road and also uh, less desirable aroma extraction at lower temperatures. We tend to see that at warmer temperatures, more of the beneficial oils and beneficial aromas are extracted, whereas less of that at lower temperatures. Contact time is a big one. Uh, we tend to see in the market that brewers often tend to leave their beer just on hops too long, period, right? So um, we find that uh, mostly, in most situations, if warm temperatures are present, that um, anything beyond 48 hours of contact time is, is often diminishing returns, right? Um, most brewers um, who tend to leave their hops on, on, or beer on hops longer than that, tend to start experiencing, you know, some more negative flavors. So grassy and sort of tannic and sharp flavors that are not as desirable, particularly in modern, you know, hazy IPA production. So what I always advise to brewers is reduce contact time to a bare necessary minimum. So what that means is if you're currently dry hopping for four days, 
try three days. If you're still getting good aroma at that point, try two days. If you're still getting good aroma at that point, try one day. And basically back it down to the very necessary minimum. Not only does this save you time in your production process where you can potentially start dumping hops sooner, it also allows you to, as I mentioned, try to uh, avoid the extraction of some of those more negative flavors that can become leached into beer uh, after extended periods of contact time. From a dosing rate perspective, uh, certainly all sorts of dosing rates are utilized these days, you know, up into even the 10 pounds per barrel range that we see among brewers and, and done with success and create tremendously lovely beer. What we tend to see as a, as a nice sweet spot for a lot of brewers, though, is somewhere between two and five pounds per barrel, which is eight to 20 grams per liter. Um, by all means, you can exceed this or you can go lower this than this and still create successful beer. But we tend to find that for really maximum and um, you know, very efficient aroma extraction, that two to five pounds per barrel of, of total dry hop load tends to be a really nice sweet spot for people and still be relatively cost effective where people can still you know, make money. <laughs> Um, and then varietal selection, as I mentioned, um, the survivables research that we've done, I think has a lot of applicable, uh, very, very uh, practical takeaways for brewers. Um, using high survivables hops early in process can really help you get more out of the hops that you're using in Whirlpool, for example, or an active fermentation dry hop. For those that don't employ any kind of active fermentation dry hop at this point, I definitely recommend it. Um, I'm a huge believer in it. Speaking in really, really rough uh, language, I would say it just tends to ex enhance the good and diminish the bad. There's just a lot, of, a lot of good things that can come from active fermentation dry hopping, and a lot of bad things can be heavily diminished by active fermentation dry hopping. So those are the four key points that I tend to put in front of people. Obviously, we could unpack that a lot more, but, um, but for the sake of time today, that's, that's kind of where I'll, think I'll leave that. And I did just want to touch real briefly on the concept of hop creep. Um, it is a major topic for brewers these days, and, and we do tend to get a lot of questions about it. So uh, in the interest of kind of addressing that real briefly here. So hop creep is um, pretty demystified, I think, for most brewers at this point. Hopefully everybody knows kind of where it comes from. Basically, there are enzymes present in hops that are able to, to further break down limit dextrins or long chain starches that, uh, that then make them fermentable by beer yeast, right? So what you have is a beer that looks like it's at terminal and it seems to be finishing itself out and then hops are added and all of a sudden the beer starts fermenting again and you end up with all a number of different problems. If that beer has already gone into package, the beer could be potentially overcarbonated. Um, if it's still in the tank and it's not monitored closely, you know, additional diacetyl production could come about and there could be a number of different sort of issues that come from that, you know, additional attenuation, so on and so forth. So uh, it really uh, is, is a feature of, of those enzymes not being denatured at that point. So enzymes that are present in hot side additions generally will be denatured, but it's the present enzymes being introduced in a cold situation, such as dry hop, where they become an, a, an issue. So long story short, hops added post-fermentation can, in certain situations, break down previously unfermentable portions of wort. What this tends to look like is, an, is a really unfortunate long tail of fermentation, right? And this is why it creates problems for brewers is this beer, which is from uh, you know, one of our colleagues breweries, appeared to be at terminal right around the fourth or fifth day here, right? It was kind of finishing its fermentation curve. And then dry hops were added on the 16th. And what we see is that the, after dry hops are added, uh, it took an, nine additional days before that beer actually finished itself fully out, right? And it had this low, slow, uh, low, a slow, long tail of, um, you know, of creeping fermentation that really creates a lot of difficulties. You can particularly imagine as you're trying to plan a brew schedule how much difficulty this could create. So uh, obviously, we want to manage this as best uh, we can. So right now, um, my, our best advice is, um, and and most uh, you know brewers who are successful at mitigating this tend to agree that it's, there's not there's not a magic bullet, unfortunately. Um, there are a number of different features that can be kind of used in composition to help attack this phenomenon. Um, we have a lot of brewers that, that, uh, that are really successful by using ALDC, which is an enzyme that's added during fermentation to help reduce the ability to produce diacetyl in the first place. And we have a lot of people that, that really sing its praises. Wort composition is a really major feature, right? Um, a beer that's dry hot, that's, that's uh, or sorry, that's, um, that's mashed to be really dry and have a low, uh, a low dextrin content at the end of fermentation is generally not going to be nearly as subject to hop creep as something that's mashed for a really high finishing gravity, right? 
So hazy IPAs, unfortunately, are kind of a perfect storm uh, for potential hop creep because of their high dextrin, uh, you know, loads. So uh, if you can alter mashing techniques and it still doesn't affect the, you know, negatively affect your beer, I would recommend considering that. Increased dry hop temperature tends to expedite uh, the effects of dry hop creep and tend to make it happen faster, which is, uh, I think, will at least help minimize some of the negative effects of it. If you have the ability to filter or pasteurize and that doesn't affect you stylistically, then I would recommend that because that can obviously create additional package stability. Being a hop supplier and a, and a hop lover, I don't tend to recommend this point, but you can potentially reduce dry hop levels. I, I, I hope you don't do that. I hope you can find a different solution for it. Um, we all love hoppy beer on this call, so I would rather you find ways to manage it elsewhere. Cold storage of beer can really help at least diminish the effects. It's not a, it's not a solution. It's really just kind of masking the problem, but if you have a very robust cold chain and your beer never leaves your tap room, then maybe it's not an issue. Maybe you don't have to worry about it, right? But uh, one of the best things that you, I think you can do is to dry hop earlier. Um, what this tends to do is sort of uh, to make the damage happen earlier, right? If, the, if sort of the, the damage of hop creep is inevitable, you'd rather it happen quicker and earlier so that it, it has less effect on your production scheduling. So I would encourage if you don't uh, uh, utilize any kind of active fermentation dry hopping in your in your regular procedures at this point, I would encourage you to consider it because it can have some really beneficial effects, both from an aromatic standpoint and from a dry hop creep mitigate, mitigation standpoint. So I'll leave it at that. Um, for any further reading on what you on some of the stuff we'd like we talked about today, I've got some resources here. We've got some previous presentations on survivables as well as some great articles that were written by some Japanese breweries on some of the uh, flavor active and, uh, and uh, really high importance um, uh, sulfur bearing compounds that we talked about. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them now or wait until the end. Uh, we also have a brewing help desk that you're uh, more than welcome to send any brewing related question in. Uh, it's staffed by former brewers and we're always happy to help with anything that we can. So thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, do we have any questions for him before we get into Charlie's? <clears throat> All right. Well, if you do, go ahead and ask. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I do actually have one question. I've never really had a good answer to this. And I, I have suspicions, but I was hoping maybe you had some insight on this. Early on, when when some of these tops came through, uh, you know, this the the citra had a what I would call the uh, a cat piss aroma, and that disappeared after a couple of days. Was there something discovered as far as growing conditions or climate or nutrition levels or age of the hops that changed things or how the hops were treated? Sure, yeah, that's a pretty common uh, that's a pretty common phenomenon. Uh, we find that, for, particularly in the case of some of the sulfur bearing compounds, so you know, four MMP and. 3MH and some of the uh, thioates, um, that there tends to be thresholds, right? Uh, where a little of a good thing can be a good thing, but a, too much of a good thing can really start to offend the human nose, right? There's, there, are, there are sensory thresholds to, to some of these compounds, right? So forum MP in particular is one of those ones where at low levels, it tends to smell really pleasant, sort of like uh, black currant or a passion fruit kind of things like that. But then at high levels, it can start to smell catty um, some people say it smells kind of like a box tree, which is not something I'm familiar with, but people do say that. Um, but uh, yes, to answer your question, absolutely. Um, I think people think that when a hop comes onto the market that it's absolutely set in stone, this is what it's always going to be. When in reality, growers are learning about how to pick a hop, how to grow a hop, how to do any of these things. And Dietrich can speak to that with, you know, I'm sure, you know, for a, a lot of that, that's, you know, you learn over the course of successive seasons, right? And so what we tend to do as a grower, and Charlie could speak about this too, I'm sure, is that you find a sweet spot within the picking window where that variety tends to really work, right? Where it tends to work for grow growers and brewers. And so as we tend to get feedback from the market, like, hey, this citrus smells great, but it has some caddy characteristics, we can tend to hone in on where that lot came from, where it was picked, right? And it's possible that it's just too late, being picked too late in the season, and it's, be it's becoming overripe on, on a certain compound that's really throwing off that aroma. We've gotten that complaint before, you know, in the past about, uh, you know, Citra and a number of others, and we don't tend to get it anymore. As you mentioned, it tends yeah. to be a non-issue now. And that's mostly, in my opinion, a feature of uh, grower practice being honed in and really also just pick windows being really dialed in to support 
a variety's development over time. So it does generally tend to, I, in my opinion, take five to seven years before a variety is really well, well known enough by growers that they feel like it's exactly where it needs to be to hit what brewers want. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Charlie. Cool. Great. Just uh, share my screen here. All right, how's that? All right, well, thanks everyone. My name is Charlie Tarlowski. I'm the Northeast sales rep for Hopsteiner. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Hopsteiner, we're actually celebrating our 175th anniversary this year. And um, which also means that we're celebrating our 155th year in New York as uh, our main headquarters. Um, we also have growing, we have growing operations in Yakima, um, as well as a processing facility in Meinberg, Germany. In addition to Yakima, um, we are a family owned company, uh, independent grower, uh, breeder, processor, and distributor of hop and hop products. Um, we're actually, we, um, we have four ranches of our own. We just recently added a fifth ranch, which is our all organic ranch. So we have a number of newer varieties um, that are all uh, organic. So today um, I wanted to talk about hop oils um, as, a, as a tool for brewers, um, something to you know, add to your tool belt as you guys are experimenting and creating new beers and discovering new flavor and aroma uh, combinations. So this shot here is um, a real close, close up shot of an inside of a hop. And what you see are the real sticky lupulin glands. And that's really what we're, what we're after when we, you know, when we're brewing really, I mean, they, they, they contain the uh, aroma and the bittering compounds. So if you take that hop and you parse it out, you know, in, inside the leaves, and stems um, or the bracken bracteoles, you'll have your you'll have your polyphenols, which are important for um, uh, hop break formation. And then you have your resins, you know your your soft resins, your alpha acids, and your beta acids, and then your hard resins, which contain uh, oxidative as well as uh, antioxidative uh, properties. But today uh, we're going to talk about oils specifically and why they're important um, from a very broad perspective, they provide all the aroma for your beer. Um, and as, as a tool, it, the, using specifically hop oils, the, the, the pure essential hop oils, you know, you're, you're able to minimize a lot of the losses and maximize the aroma in your beer. So, so talking about losses, you know, if you're looking at your typical um, T90 pellet, um, as you all know, when once added to, you know, statically added to the fermenter or the, or the maturation tank, um, they, they tend to have a, uh, a pretty large swelling effect um, to, to, the, to the range of about six times the volume in which you add them. Um, also, you can increase the weight of the, of the troop pile um, by 12 times. So that's a significant amount of beer that's being left behind um, up to, you know, depending on how much you're using, um, we've seen up to about 30% 30 uh, 30 beer loss. <clears throat> so, so hop oils, uh, it's, a, it's a refined product. Um, it's, it comes from uh, two different methods, uh, steam distillation of kilned uh, un uncompressed hop cones and then there's thin film evaporation from uh, a CO2 extract process. Um, there's a number of benefits um, in terms of uh, you know, bulk shipment and storage, you, you know, save on a, a shipment cost because the amount you use would be typically less than a T90 pellet. Um, and it's, it's packaged by weight. So um, 
you know, you have that versatility to use um, a little bit at a time. Um, so the main impact and the main driver of this product is the um, aroma effect. And this can be added into the kettle post-fermentation, uh, early, in early in fermentation, or even uh, downstream addition. Um, if, if this is added uh, post-kettle, post so uh, anywhere in the uh, cold side, uh, this product would need to be uh, dissolved in either uh, an ethanol, a propylene glycol, or a combination. Sometimes we've, we've, we found it effective in, in beer to have a, a 5%, 95%, a 5% solution of ethanol and 95% um, uh, propylene glycol blend. Uh, seems to be very uh, effective uh, because again, you know, so if you're adding oil to beer, you, you need to separate the phase. And so this uh, dilution acts as a solvent to separate that phase to make it more uh, soluble in beer. And, and as you can see in the picture, it's also uh, variety specific. Um, <clears throat> with, the, with the two different styles uh, comes, you know, two different costs. Um, since uh, the steam distilled it comes from uh, compressed whole or uncompressed whole cone hops. Um, we're able to use some more of the, let's say, sexier hops. So the Sultana and the Calypso Trident and, and Lotus, but they also tend to be more expensive because it's a destructive process. So the only uh, thing that, the only product that can come from the steam distillation is the hop oils. Unlike uh, the thin film evaporated hop oils, uh, which is non-destructive, it's a, um, we're, we're able to fractionate the oils from the CO2 extract, which we use for, you know, for uh, bittering purposes in the kettle, but also it's the, it's the uh, source product for other downstream products, uh, such as uh, beta extract or tetra and rho and hexa. So we wanna look at the impact of the T90s compared to the hop oils, and this was this was a study um, where we had 700 tasters. This was done at the Brow uh, a, a few years ago, and um, we added the um, we added at the same point, so from from fermenter to maturation tank, um, one beer which had 300 grams per hectoliter, or a 3.6 gram per hectoliter of pure a pure oil addition um, in the form of uh, pellets, and then we also added. Um, 2.4 grams per hectoliter of pure oil, um, of uh, Bravo pure oil um, to that, to, to a separate beer. And we learned about that through uh, trial and error that using about one third less um, oil equivalent to that of P90s gets you roughly the same result. And that was confirmed in this, uh, in this, in the study and you'll see where the P90 addition lays out in the spider graph chart compared to the hop oil addition, which is roughly the same. And so going back to the addition of the uh, Bravo hop oil at maturation, and then the Bravo hop oil at filtration, you'll see two different um, two different aroma uh, aroma presentations. You'll see that the Bravo addition at filtration um, tends to be a little bit more herbal uh, than compared to what it was when it was add when it was added from filtration to maturation. Um, and, and mainly, this can be you know attributed to some of that biotransformation that's going on, as opposed to uh, the addition to filtration which would still have many of the, um, the monoterpenes or maybe some of the less desirable um, uh, hop aroma compounds uh, still in solution. Uh, and this was, this was another, um, this is another uh, sensory of a new variety that we have, it's uh, 09326. And this chart uh, represents a, uh, a dry rub of the hop, so this was not in beer. And then you can see um, how how that lays out differently 
from oil to pellets, you'll see that the, the, that the oil tends to be a little bit more sugar-like, a little bit more fruity than the pellet contribution, which tends to have you know, that herbal spice and a bit more um, resinous flavor and aromas. So ideally you wanna be adding this product to the cold side of fermentation. Um, we're not the cold side of fermentation, but just the, the cold block. So the cold side, so anything that's beyond uh, the kettle, whirlpool or hopback, if you have one. Um, typically what we were finding is, you know, when you're adding them on the brew house side, you're getting a lot of um, loss of the more desirable aromas. Um, such as like the 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 mono uh, terpene oxides, so you're you're having a pretty substantial reduction of those uh, from a range of like fifty to seventy percent um, if you add them in these oils into the whirlpool, and roughly about eighty percent if added to say like a cool whirlpool or like a hot back addition. So you really get the most bang for your buck. <clears throat> Excuse me. If, um, if added to the fermenter or maturation tank, or depending on the variety that you're looking for or the particular aroma flavor profile, you can certainly add those um, you know, post-fermentation post prior to filtration. But um, yeah, so we're seeing you know, when you, we, you add them early, you're seeing the effect of uh, the biotransformation on the monoterpenes um, from uh, specifically you know, uh, geranial converting into uh, linalool, neural, um, and then also uh, some of those volatile compound um, aroma. The, the volatile aroma compounds are uh, being scrubbed out by uh, CO2, like uh, myrcene, or more specifically, uh, the, ad the adaptation of yeast cells, which it seems that that myrcene compound seems to bind really well to those um, yeast cells. So there's definitely uh, advantages to adding it um, to the fermenter or um, in between fermenter and bright tank if you don't have a maturation tank or if you don't even filter. Um, but again, I mean, looking back at those, uh, those, those charts that, are, that were showing you, um, the extraction is very dependent on the technology that you're using, um, the time, the temperature, all of these factors um, influence the expression of the hop oils in the finished beer. Um, not it wouldn't be any different than um, if you were to add, say, you know, T90s early or late, or, or in a hop back, you know, um, or any you know uh, concentrated hop products. That 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 expression um, is is different based on those factors of time, temperature, um, if there's yeast in suspension or not. But um, we do find it's typically a little bit easier to dose uh, prior to filtration. And I can talk about that um, a little bit further about how, how to add this product um, into, in, into your beer. I'll just add all these up here. Okay, so you, know, you have your kettle edition, you know, your whirlpool edition, um, you have your hot back edition. And then, so this is your fermenter here. So, you know, these can go, the, the, the hop oils can work in conjunction, you know, with your, with your T90s or your, or your, you know, T45s or your concentrated pellets um, early. You can add them late into, late into formation. You can add them, um, you know, prior to your maturation or from maturation into your DE filter. Or if you have a trap filter later on, you can add it at that point too. Just keep in mind that you're going to have a different um, flavor aroma profile at each one of these points. So you definitely want to be experimenting, um, doing benchtop trials to see um, how to maximize that aroma that you're looking for um, with different dosing protocols and at different times. Um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to add a post trap filter um, prior to the bright tank because if you're dealing with bright beer, which I'm not sure many people are these days, but if you are dealing with bright beer, um, this could cause some gushing um, or some haze, um, which you wouldn't want with that kind of beer.
All right, so let's talk about how to get this, get this into your beer. Um, some of the best practices we find is through um, a meter pump or a membrane pump. You know, so down here is your beer. Uh, you have your flow meter, which would, which measures the um, the flow rate of your beer. It goes to the control unit. The control unit would then will dictate the um, the amount or the 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 pulse or the rate of pumping of the of the pump in relation to the flow of the beer, right? So um, we recommend that if you're doing this like post fermentation um, or in between fermentation and maturation or in between fermentation and your bright tank that you meter it over 80% of, um, of the transfer. That's, that's ideal um, just because with the lack of convection of the fermentation in order to get the hop oils into solution, you want to avoid any kind of like localization or layering effect. So being able to meter it over a long period of time um, is, is, is best. And also you also want to keep in mind that, that you want to have a, a good amount of turbulence too, to, to mix it up even further. So ideally you would have like a, like a 90 degree bend here, which would mix that even further. Um, and here's a look at um, a couple different, you know, uh, here's a dosing pump and there's a little smaller metering pump, which probably be more in line with, you know, the needs or the needs of uh, craft brewers, maybe like some, some smaller craft breweries could, could use this. These things, these probably run, I don't know, about 1500 bucks. Um, but yeah, so like I said before, like a, a constant, and even dosage over the entire volume is is recommended. Um, sometimes that's not always ideal, but um, we can talk about some other methods to uh, get this product into your beer. Um, the, the oils themselves um, do or will will oxidize over time, um, but you know you can you can work with them over you know over a period of a month if you open up open them up once per week. Um, and so the, the hop oil application, if you're not doing any filtration, um, is pretty easy. Um, you can, you can add it basically almost at any point, um, early, late fermentation and even into the bright tank. And then if you're, and then again, if you're adding uh, hop oils with, with the capabilities of, uh, filtering, um, it should be added, uh, before the last step of filtration. Uh, before the trap filter. And so this is another method that you could possibly use um, in order to add the hop oils in, whether it's doing fermentation or in between fermentation and the bright tank. You see here, there's a inch and a half sight glass, you have a butterfly valve below that. And then above here, um, there's an end cap with a is CO2 quick disconnect. So here the brewers filling up the site glass with the amount of oil that they want to add to the beer, applying pressure. Um, you obviously would want to um, purge this with CO2. So they're applying pressure, then, then opening up the, the uh, butterfly valve and shooting this, um, shooting this in line at the early part of the transfer. So um, you can shoot it in line, or you could even like meter it out just by pumping up the uh, the uh, valve a bit too, or do that like over time. But um, this brewer found it very effective to just you know open up the, the the butterfly valve, shoot it all in early, and then allow for a very uh, rapid transfer. So um, the flow of the beer going into the bright tank um, with some head pressure on, obviously. Um, would um, have that oil mixed up very well. And we're seeing some other applications for oils, not only in beer, um, but it's pretty popular now um, in Europe, in hard seltzers, regular seltzers, and even uh, ciders. And so just to kind of go over briefly uh, some of the advantages and some of the key points in this, um, 
you know, you can really get a lot of the fruity limelight characters that are very similar to um, a dry hopping or late hopping character through, uh, through bio transformation if added early. Um, and um, a lot of the variety specifics will have different concentrations of those compounds such as uh, drainal or linoleal. Um, you can increase higher yields because you're adding aroma without any plant matter. Products light stable. Uh, there's no influence on bitterness. And, and I, I know that previous slide that there was, there seemed to be um, less bitterness. In, um, this is the slide that compared the uh, Bravo oil to the Bravo um, pellets. So the, the, the perceived bitterness was the same, but the bitterness that was measured was through um, UV Viz, which picked up some of the alpha acids, which, which are readable. So analytically through uh, UV Viz, it showed that the pellets had a little bit higher, so but they were um, exactly the same um, in terms of uh, perceived bitterness. Um, there's zero nitrate impact, so you're not adding any oxidative uh, components to the beer. Um, you have lower annual shipping costs. You can save on save on your storage space needs. Um, you can decrease waste um, and reduce the environmental impact, and um, you can also decrease the occurrence of hop creep because it doesn't have those limit dextrinase enzymes um, in the in the oils at all. So that's all I have. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Um, I hope this get, kind of gets you thinking about um, using some other products to incorporate into uh, maybe existing ones um, that could really help you guys uh, boost your aromas, decrease your yields. Awesome. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. That was great. Uh, do we have any questions for Charlie or anyone else? We have about, uh, we can go over the about 10 minutes if we do. Now's your time. All right, guys. Well, if you do have any questions. That was, that was very, very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Ethan? You kind of broke up. Oh, I just said that was very, very thorough on, on the part of all three presenters. So um, I do not have questions at this time. Well, thank you guys very much, uh, Spencer, Charlie, and Dietrich for coming together to teach us about hops and give us some new techniques to practice with. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you all to our sponsors. And uh, I hope to see you at 2.30 for Yeast Blend, Secrets to Creating Complexity. And if you missed any other sessions or want to rewatch this, just uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll put it in chat and you can watch it. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, everyone.